Growing up, I never thought I'd end up running the family business, but my dad's huge presence in the landscaping world set me on this path. I started with the basics, filing, sweeping, you name it, and slowly took on more responsibilities, learning to really appreciate what we did. My dad was all about hard work, so he had me out in the field from the get-go, teaching me the ropes and the real value of dedication and integrity. By the time I wrapped up high school, I was already leading crews during the summer, and I felt a real bond with the business. When I took over, I knew I had some big shoes to fill, but with my dad's lessons and my own drive, I felt ready. Managing the business in this tech-driven age has its own set of hurdles. Sure, technology makes things like invoicing and payroll easier, but when it crashes, it can throw everything into chaos. In the seven years I've been at the helm, I've had my share of computer meltdowns, but I've learned to keep backups, both local and in the cloud, and set up contingencies to keep things running smoothly during outages. But enough tech talk. I'm Donald Summers, though my friends call me Don, and only my wife and mom call me Donnie. I'm 35, 6'5", and 227 pounds, with a tan from years spent outside. My wife Brittany, also 35, is a personal trainer, blonde, blue-eyed and petite, but strong. We've been married for 13 years and have two kids, Danielle 9 and Brian 7. Summer's landscaping was started by my dad, and I always knew I'd take over someday. As a kid, I worked alongside my parents since I was their only child. My dad made sure I learned the business from the ground up, which I ended up loving. By high school, I was running crews, and seven years ago, when I took over, I expanded to 12 crews and added services like snow removal for winter. Even though I'm mostly in the office now, I still enjoy getting out on site now and then. March and April are my busiest months with taxes, personnel records, and contracts. This year, my mom helped out, but she's not great with tech and accidentally deleted some crucial files. Luckily, I had backups, but restoring them took a while. While waiting, I used Google Earth to check out some project sites. It's a handy tool for getting a top-down view of a site before starting major work. During my break, I thought I'd check out my house. We'd been thinking about adding a pool now that the kids are older, that as I zoomed in, I noticed a red car in my driveway that I didn't recognize. It was a recent photo, taken last winter, so the image was only a few months old. The car wasn't one I knew from Brit's circle. Switching to Street View, I saw my wife Brittany in the doorway, hugging and kissing a guy I didn't recognize. My blood boiled, but I forced myself to stay calm. I printed out the photo and scrutinized the guy. Though the angle hit his face, he looked familiar. After some thought, I realized he resembled Brit's college ex, Ben Clausen. That hit me hard, but I needed to get to the bottom of this before reacting. I considered various ways to investigate, cameras, recorders, or maybe hiring a PI, but I needed more clarity first. Digging into Ben's background, I found out he's a successful real estate agent after a brief NFL career cut short by an injury. He's been back in town for a couple of years and runs his own office. He's married with a kid. His wife, Angela, is attractive, but I still think Brittany's way out of his league. I was still fuming over the Google Earth image, so I decided to call Ben's office. The receptionist told me Ben was out showing a property and wouldn't be back for an hour. I didn't leave a message and hung up, still seething. I grabbed the photo and headed to my truck, noticing a toy car in the back, a reminder of my son. It made me pause thinking about how my actions might affect my kids. After a quick internal debate, I drove to Ben's office downtown. I recognized one of my crew foremen nearby, but didn't stop. I was focused on confronting this situation. When I walked into the Clausen real estate office, I drew some curious looks from the suited office workers. I finally reached the fifth floor and spotted Mrs. Clausen. She looked different from her photos, slimmer and taller, but her friendly demeanor and handshake made a good impression. I introduced myself, Hi, I'm Donald Summers. Nice to meet you, Mr. Summers. How can I help you? 
she asked. I replied, Mrs. Clausen, I've got a photo I'd like you to see and a few questions. Her expression turned serious as she realized this wasn't about buying a house. She regained her professional composure and led me to the break room. Sitting down, she gestured for me to join her, clearly waiting for me to get to the point. I handed her the photo and said, The woman in this photo is my wife, Brittany. She used to date Ben Clausen in college. Angela hesitated before taking the photo, her eyes shifting from curiosity to sadness and finally to anger. After a tense moment, she handed it back to me. Yes, that's him, she said. When was this taken? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. No more than three months ago, I replied, showing her the photo I'd pulled from Google Earth. I pointed out the earrings I had given Brittany for Christmas, which lined up with the timeline. Angela's face softened briefly with sympathy before her expression hardened once more. I'm sure it's Ben. Have you confronted your wife yet? Angela asked. Not yet, I said. She should be at work right now. Angela's skepticism prompted me to call Brittany. When she didn't answer, I rang the gym where she worked. Mandy, a trainer and friend, answered and hesitantly informed me that Brittany had left about ten minutes ago, supposedly to meet me for lunch at Logan's. I checked Brittany's location using the Find My Phone app. It showed she was at home. I shared this with Angela, who immediately got fired up. She stormed out of the office, heading for the exit. I rushed to keep up. Chris, she called out. I'm going to lunch. If Ben comes back before I do, call me immediately. Angela's anger was palpable as we got into the elevator. You better have a damn good explanation for that photo, she said. I was caught off guard. You've let him off the hook before? I asked, then quickly apologized for prying. Angela brushed it off, revealing Ben had cheated on her before, back in Colorado. They had moved to Indiana for a fresh start, but she wasn't in a forgiving mood this time. As we drove in silence, Angela finally spoke. I'm surprised your wife would bring my husband into your home. It's a calculated risk, I replied. She knows I'm usually stuck in the office this time of year and would call before coming home, giving her time to cover her tracks. I knew my bitterness was evident and shot Angela an apologetic look. I'm so predictable and gullible, I said. She could have been cheating for years and I'd never know. Angela was silent as I sped toward my house. When she spoke again, her voice was filled with sympathy. There are usually signs when a spouse is cheating, she said quietly. Yes, I know, I replied, but I haven't seen any our bedroom life hasn't changed, and she hasn't acted differently toward me or the kids, she doesn't go out with friends much either. Angela's voice cracked as she added, there weren't any signs with Ben either. As I turned onto my street, I spotted a red car in my driveway. Angela's voice broke the silence. That's Ben's car, she said, her anger and sadness blending together. If we found what we expected, it would likely end both of our marriages. I parked on the street and headed toward the backyard, Angela trailing behind. She pulled out a digital camera from her purse, and I regretted not grabbing mine from the office. We quietly entered through the back door. Inside, I could hear my wife's unmistakable moans of pleasure. Underneath my rage, my heart shattered hearing Brittany's voice. I signaled for Angela to follow as I moved through the kitchen. I expected to find them in the living room, but when I peeked in, I saw Brittany on the couch with another woman. I scanned the room and spotted Ben filming the scene on his tablet. Angela was also recording with her camera. As my fury surged, Angela grabbed my arm, trying to hold me back. I hesitated, thinking the damage was already done, so what was another second? But when Ben joined in, I lost it. Angela couldn't stop me as I stormed into the room. The other woman turned in shock as I grabbed Ben and threw him to the floor. Shut up, all of you. I roared, punching Ben. Don't move or I swear I'll tear you apart. I looked at the other woman and realized it was Jamie Keller, the 19-year-old neighbor who babysat for us. Jamie? I asked in disbelief. 
She nodded, looking pitiful. I'm sorry, she whispered. How long has this been going on? I growled. This is only the second time, I swear, she stammered. You're a damn liar, I spat. Cheating is cheating, whether it's with a man or a woman. If Brittany slept with someone else, it was betrayal. I picked up Ben's tablet, which had fallen during the commotion, and made sure Jamie could see it. Angela took one last look at the tablet, her face a mix of horror and resignation. I have a video of you doing some very inappropriate things. Get out of my house and never come back. If you ever contact my wife again, even accidentally, I'll make sure this video ends up everywhere. Online, to your family, anyone who'll listen. I'll ruin your reputation. Understand? Jamie stared at me, her face pale, as I shook the tablet in front of her. Yes, she whispered, trembling. I understand. Good, I snapped. Now get out, you dirty strumpet. I called my father-in-law, George, and put the call on speaker. Brittany's eyes squeezed shut, her silent plea clear. I wasn't about to let her off easy. Hey, George, I said, try to keep my voice steady. Don, it's good to hear from you. How are you? He replied warmly. George, something serious has come up with Brittany and me. Can you and Virginia come over as soon as possible? He immediately grew concerned. Are the kids okay? The kids are fine. This is about Brittany and me. I'd rather show you than explain over the phone. George was silent for a long moment, probably piecing things together. We'll be there in 15 minutes. Please don't do anything rash before we arrive. I won't, I assured him and ended the call. I made a similar call to my own parents, then put the phone away. Brittany was sobbing uncontrollably on the couch, knowing what was coming. Angela, however, stayed calm. He needs a hospital, Don, she said firmly. I understand you want to destroy your wife, but I have limits. Fine, I replied. How about calling an ambulance instead? Angela studied me seeing that I wasn't denying her request, but was delaying her departure. She sighed and agreed. All right, but once your revenge plays out, I'm taking him to the air, she said. Keep the tablet and camera until you get what you need after that, return the camera, I'll need it for the divorce. Thank you, Angela, I added. She nodded and made a call to her office, stating she had an emergency and was closing for the day. Mr. Clausen is on his way to the Ur, she told them. I wondered why she was still with him after his betrayal, but that was her decision. My parents arrived first, given their proximity. When they saw the scene, Brittany, Ben, and Angela, Mom froze, and Dad stared in shock. Donnie, what's going on? Mom asked, while Dad just placed a comforting hand on my shoulder, understanding without needing an explanation. Mom, blushing at the sight of Brittany, hissed, Danny, what is all this? I explained everything to her, leaving nothing out, and offered to show her the video from two angles. She quickly declined, her face turning even redder. She was about to hand Brittany an afghan, but I stopped her. No, Mom, I want George and Virginia to see her for what she is. I want them to know it's not my fault this marriage is ending. Brittany pleaded, Donnie, please don't, but I cut her off. Shut up, what did you expect? I caught you and you thought I wouldn't want a divorce, you're clueless. My in-laws, George and Virginia, arrived soon after. Virginia's shock was evident when she saw Brittany. What is going on? she exclaimed, nearly tripping over Ben. Who is this? she asked, her eyes wide. I turned to Brittany. Are you going to explain, or should I? When she stayed silent, I recounted everything, from my discovery to meeting Angela and finding them at home. Both sets of parents were silent until Virginia spoke up. This must be a mistake. Brittany wouldn't do this. I have video proof, I said calmly. Would you like to see it? I pulled out the SD card, ready to show them. Don't. My mom pleaded, her voice filled with sympathy. It won't solve anything and will just hurt more people. 
I won't let anyone doubt the truth, I insisted. I want to settle this here and now. George intervened, raising his hand. What are you going to do now? That's the real question. I looked at him, my resolve clear. I'm sorry, George, but divorce is the only option. I can't live with someone like her. As Angela helped Ben gather his things, I continued. First, I want custody of the kids, Brittany can visit, but they'll live with me, that's non-negotiable. Virginia tried to object, but I cut her off. This isn't a negotiation, if I don't get what I want, Brittany's actions will be all over the internet, do we understand? I turned to Brittany. Do you understand? She finally snapped, yelling, don't call me a strumpet. You are a strumpet, I shouted back and I won't let you raise our daughter to be like you. The argument escalated into a screaming match that lasted for hours. Then I realized the school bus would be arriving soon. The kids will be home soon, I said coldly. Go clean up and get dressed before they get here, then we'll explain why mommy won't be living here anymore. Brittany shot back, I'll tell them why daddy isn't here anymore. Fine, I replied. But don't take too long. I carried the camera to the den, where our home computer was, making it clear I wasn't bluffing. Brittany rushed after me, realizing I was serious. Brittany screamed, Wait, you know the courts won't give you custody. I replied, These days, I could commit a crime and still get custody. Not if you tell the judge you don't want it, she said, staring at me, I let my anger show wanting her to understand how much she'd hurt me. When she didn't back down, I shrugged and turned away. Don, you can't do this, she shouted. Watch me, I replied. You won't. You love me. That used to be true, I said. But now, I've learned more about you than I ever wanted to. It wasn't fun, she cried again. But I didn't care. I was emotionally drained and just wanted this over. Do you hate me enough to really do this? She asked. Yes, I replied. I'll never forgive you. If you don't give me what I want in the divorce, I'll spend the rest of my life destroying you, even if it ruins me too. I paused, thinking about how long she might have been unfaithful. Are Danielle and Brian even mine, Brittany? How can you ask that? She said, shocked. How can you cheat on me with multiple people? I shot back. I don't know what to believe anymore. I never imagined you'd betray me like this. I pocketed the SD card and gripped the tablet, then walked back to the living room with Brittany following. As I approached, I overheard my parents and her parents talking. You don't really think he'll do it, do you, Frank? It could ruin Brittany's future, Virginia said. My dad responded, after what she did, I don't care about her future. She deserves whatever she gets. When I entered the room, everyone looked at me. Virginia seemed nervous. I shot her a look of disgust but didn't comment. I understood she'd stand by her daughter, despite everything. Don, it's not fair to insist on custody, Virginia began. Kids need their mom. Mrs. Carson, do you think I care what you think? I replied. Fight it and you know the consequences. I'm surprised none of you care that Brittany cheated, but whatever. You're free to leave. Take your daughter with you, if you'd like. They stared at me, shocked, then began muttering about how rude I was and hoping Brittany would take everything in the divorce. As you might guess, things didn't go as either of us planned. Brittany might have exaggerated about the courts, but not by much. I didn't think she'd call my bluff about the video, but she did. Unfortunately for her, I wasn't bluffing. After the judge awarded her custody, she smirked at me. I just glared back. Later, I used Ben's tablet at a coffee shop to upload the edited video to every website I could find. I sent the links to Brittany's family using Ben's email and posted them on his social media accounts. Then I tossed the tablet in the river. True to my word, Britt became somewhat infamous after I posted the video. She lost her job at the gym, but she still kept custody. Thankfully, since the divorce was finalized before she was laid off, 
I didn't have to pay spousal support. She tried to get a piece of the family business but failed since I don't technically own it yet. My dad does. I just manage it, and my salary comes from him, so our finances were separate. The judge ordered me to pay $600 in a month in child support, but my lawyer delayed the payments until we got paternity test results. I mostly demanded the test to hurt Brit, but I was relieved when they confirmed the kids were mine. Brit got half of our savings and checking accounts but couldn't afford to keep the house, so she had to sell it. We split the money, and she bought a smaller house nearby. I also bought a small house in the same school district, though I had to cut back on spending to afford it with child support. My debt offered to increase my salary, but I declined since it would just raise my support payments. Danielle and Brian liked my new house, but hated that their mom and I were no longer together. I tried to keep them busy with trips to the park, biking, hiking, and occasional swims at the aquatic center. As for my personal life, I started dating again after the divorce. I hadn't done anything wrong, so I didn't see a reason to be alone. While I had no trouble finding dates, I was looking for a real relationship. The kids sometimes mentioned their mom, trying to bring us back together, but I reminded them that we weren't getting back together. I no longer had feelings for her. About six months after the divorce, I ran into Mandy Thomas, a trainer from the gym where Britt used to work. We chatted at the grocery store, and I noticed she seemed as interested in me as I was in her. When she asked if I was seeing anyone, I admitted I wasn't. She leaned in, touched my arm, and smiled. Do you like what you see? She asked playfully. Yes, I do, I replied, deciding to take a chance. I invited her over for dinner, wrapping my arms around her waist. And maybe we can talk about dessert. My relationship with Mandy restored a confidence I hadn't realized I'd lost. She was an amazing partner, smart, funny, great with kids, and always supportive. After our third date, we decided to be exclusive, and I never regretted it. She filled the void in my life, and for the first time since my divorce, I was truly happy. A few months into our relationship, I got an unexpected call from my former in-laws. George Carson informed me that Brittany was in the hospital, and they needed me to pick up the kids. He probably expected me to ask why she was hospitalized, but I didn't care. I only asked if it was something that could damage the kids. When he mentioned she was at the Catherine Center, a mental health facility, I shrugged it off and ended the call. On my way to pick up the kids, I briefly thought about Brittany and why she destroyed our marriage. I had analyzed it many times, but never asked her directly, as I didn't trust she'd tell the truth. In the end, it didn't matter. For me, infidelity was unforgivable. I wasn't going to lose my self-respect by staying with her. When I arrived at the Carson's house, I could tell Danielle and Brian weren't doing well. They clung to each other, which wasn't typical for them. George looked bitter and angry as he sent the kids inside to get their things. Once we were alone, he confronted me. What's wrong with you, Don? He demanded. Other than mild nearsightedness, nothing, I replied sarcastically. Stop being a smart rear. Your wife is in a mental hospital, and you don't care. First of all, she's not my wife anymore, I shot back. She destroyed our marriage, not me, and yes, I don't care. Why should I? She cheated on me, not the other way around. It's your fault she's in the hospital, George retorted. You posted that video and ruined her reputation, making it hard for her to find a job. I warned everyone I would do it if I didn't get what I wanted. She chose to fight me and now faces the consequences. If she's not making what she's worth, maybe she should talk to her pimp, I replied coldly. You son of a witch, he shouted, grabbing my vest. I calmly freed his hand, not wanting to hurt him but making it clear I wouldn't be pushed around. Think carefully before you use force, George, I said. I know you love Brittany, but everything that's happened is her own doing. Even you must see that. Wouldn't you have done the same in my position? He eventually relaxed and I let go. He seemed more defeated than angry. Maybe I would, he admitted. It's just easier to be mad at you than face what my daughter did. 
Go ahead and tell me what's going on, I said, still a more. George hesitated, then revealed Brittany tried to liquidate herself. Do the kids know? I asked. Yes, he said, pained. Danielle found her unconscious after taking a bottle of sleeping pills she called emergency. I felt awful for Danielle, imagining the trauma she went through, but I was also proud of her for staying calm and doing the right thing. I made a mental note to praise her for it. How are they coping? I asked. Danielle and Brian are both upset, but Brian's taking it the hardest. Danielle hasn't left his side, George said. I thanked him for telling me and reassured him I'd keep a close eye on the kids. Over the next few days, I did exactly that. I talked to Danielle and Brian about what happened, praising Danielle for her quick thinking, which made her beam with pride. After weeks of treatment, Brittany was discharged. They say she's recovered, I told Mandy, but I'm skeptical. I don't see how therapy and medication alone can fix problems that led her to attempt self-destruction. Brittany wanted to return to joint custody. I asked the kids how they felt. Danielle hesitated, but Brian was thrilled at the idea of spending time with his mom again. Mandy was practical. Unless you want another long legal battle, you'll have to agree. You could argue she's unfit given the self-destruction attempt, but it might not be worth it. I felt conflicted. I won't try to stop her from seeing the kids, I said, resign. Mandy softened. I didn't think you would. I just don't want the kids to go through another traumatic experience. I don't know what turned her into this selfish, irresponsible. I struggled. Which? But it happened. Mandy leaned back, thoughtful, and then smiled. Why don't we talk about something more pleasant, she suggested, stroking my hand. I smiled back. What do you have in mind? At that moment, I knew it was time. Over the past few months, I had grown even closer to Mandy. She was everything I wanted in a partner, and I realized it was time to ask her the big question. I thought we could talk about our future, I said, pulling out the ring box. Mandy, I love you, and so did the kids. I hate being apart from you. Will you marry me? Her eyes widened as she looked at the ring. The kids helped me pick it out, I added. Mandy looked at me sadly, then gently closed the ring box. Don, this is beautiful, and I'm touched. But marriage? Really? She shook her head. You're a wonderful lover and a great father, but marriage isn't what I want. Especially not with someone who has kids and an ex to deal with. I've enjoyed our time together, but for me it was just fun, not a step toward marriage. My heart sank. I see, I said quietly, tossing the ring box aside. Thanks for being honest, I'm sorry for bothering you. Mandy was already getting her things. I met her at the door where we exchanged one last look. I leaned in for a goodbye kiss, but she turned her cheek. Realizing it was over, I closed the door behind her. The weeks after Mandy left were tough. I'd been through breakups before, but this one hurt more probably because she was the first woman I connected with emotionally after my divorce. The kids asked about Mandy. Why did she leave, Dad? Brian asked. It wasn't about you, I explained. She just didn't want to see me anymore. Danielle, perceptive for her age, seemed to sense more but let it go. As time passed, Brian often mentioned his mom, trying to bring us back together in his own way. It was understandable, but I knew I had to move on. I went on dates, making sure there were no misunderstandings this time. I was upfront about not rushing into anything serious. Most women weren't interested in anything long-term once they heard about my ex-wife's issues. I couldn't blame them. Life felt lonely. I still talked to Angela occasionally. She had divorced Ben, but didn't take much from him. I didn't want the big house, she told me. Too many memories. I just want a home, not a status symbol. So, what did you do? I asked, curious about how Angela handled her situation. We sold the house and split the equity, each buying our own place. I didn't sell my share of Ben's real estate business and I chose not to pursue the maximum alimony I could. 
I'm stronger than that, she said with pride. I respect that, I nodded. Angela never judged me for posting the video of Brittany. I can't blame you, she said. But that video won't get you custody unless Brittany agrees. I know I admit it, but I had to do something. Angela looked at me knowingly. You're still angry, she said softly. I sighed. Yeah, but not as much as before. She didn't push further and shifted the topic. How are the kids? They're okay, I replied. Brian's still hopeful his mom and I will get back together. Danielle's too smart for her own good. Kids grow up fast, Angela said with a wistful smile. Yeah, they do, I agreed. Her son Robbie often visited since he and Brian were in the same grade. One afternoon, when Angela came to pick him up, she found the ring box. Don, what's this? She asked, holding it up. I sighed. That's what's left of my engagement to Mandy. After hearing my story, Angela shook her head sadly. I'm sorry, Don. Thanks, I said. But I'm just not great at picking the right people, she laughed. Join the club, I'm not much better. We both laughed, though we knew Angela had someone special in her life. It seemed like wedding bells were on the horizon for her. Do you think the problem is me? I asked after a pause. Angela looked at me thoughtfully. Maybe you have unresolved issues. You never found out why your ex cheated, did you? That could still be weighing you down. I never tried to find out, I admitted. But will talking to Brittany really help? Maybe. What do you have to lose? She shrugged. Good point, I said. I guess it can't hurt. At Sunday, when I dropped the kids off at Brittany's house, I decided to talk to her. The kids looked surprised as I walked them to the door. Dad, what are you doing? Brian asked. I need to talk to your mom, I said. No worries. They nodded, then I knocked on the door. Brittany answered, surprised to see me. What do you want? She asked, barely polite. I need to talk to you in private, I replied. She sent the kids inside and crossed her arms. What does the great Dawn want? I want to know why you cheated on me, I said simply. What? She was genuinely surprised. I want to know why, I repeated. It's been over a year, why ask now? She snapped. I was too angry to care before, I admitted. But now, I want to know why you destroyed our marriage. You're blaming it all on me, she said bitterly. You're the one who cheated, I replied calmly. I never did. If you don't want to tell me, just say so and I'll leave. She hesitated, her emotions shifting visibly. Finally, she looked down and then met my eyes. I felt the desire to be with another woman, she admitted quietly. Why didn't you explore this in college before we started dating? I asked. I tried, but I always chicken out worried my parents would find out, she said. After a pause, she continued. One night, Jamie caught me alone in the women's locker room. After that, I realized I couldn't give her up. So, you decided you were gay? I asked, still in disbelief. Brittany shook her head. No, I'm bisexual. But I knew how you felt about monogamy, and even if I gave up Jamie, that first time would have ended things for you. You're right, I said. I made that clear from the start. Yes, you did, she agreed. But it wasn't easy to give up everything for that fling, she added with some emotion in her voice. Damn it, Brittany, it couldn't have been that hard, I replied, feeling my anger rising. What about Ben? He's not another woman. No, he's not, she admitted. He started as a client, then kept pushing for something more. I resisted for a while but eventually gave in. I knew if you found out I was already done for, so I tried to keep it secret. So it wasn't just one mistake, I said trying to stay calm. No, she admitted. It went on for weeks. Until you put a stop to it. I ruined it? I asked in disbelief. You're blaming me? For once, I'm not blaming you, she said. But yes, you ended it. I almost wish I hadn't asked.
I said quietly. Angela thought knowing why would help but I feel worse. You didn't respect me enough to be honest. You just went after what you wanted. Brittany shrugged. I didn't think about you until it was too late. Did you ever love me? I asked. Yes, I did, she said, showing some emotion. And I regret hurting you and the kids. But that doesn't change what happened. Were you ever faithful? I asked. Yes, she replied. I was faithful until that night with Jamie. After that I was a mess and my therapist helped me realize how wrong I was. She paused, then her voice turned angry again. But you didn't have to ruin everything, Dawn. You messed up my relationship with my parents and destroyed my reputation. I can't find a job in my field and moving won't help. You even ruined Jamie's life. She doesn't talk to me anymore because of that video. How could you do that? I took a deep breath, trying to stay calm. I warned you that if I didn't get what I wanted in the divorce, I'd do it. You chose to ignore that, thinking I was bluffing. But I'm not a liar, Brittany. Tears streamed down her face. No, Don. You did it for revenge. Your ego couldn't handle the hurt. No, Brittany, I replied quietly. If you'd been honest and told me everything up front, I might have hated you. But I'd still respect you. Instead, you chose to cheat. You're not even as honest as a streetwalker. They at least admit what they are. The words hit her hard. But she didn't argue. She just looked at me with a mix of sadness and regret. Dawn, I know I have no right to be mad at you, she said softly. My therapist says I'm really mad at myself, but I directed at you. I told the kids the divorce was my fault, not yours. Thank you for that, Brittany, I replied, feeling some tension ease. It'll help the kids. I started to leave, thinking the conversation was over, but Brittany stopped me. Wait, she said, I have questions too. I turned back surprised. What kind of questions? Why did you give up on me so easily? She asked, confused. Why didn't you fight for me? That's ridiculous, I snapped. Don't you remember our conversations while dating? We talked about how infidelity destroys families. I told you cheating was the one thing I'd never forgive. There was nothing left to fight for after you made that choice. She sobbed quietly, but then gathered herself to ask, How did you find out I was cheating? We were so careful. I let out a bitter chuckle. It was a complete accident, I said, then explained the events of that morning. As I told the story, her eyes widened in disbelief. When I finished, she sank into a chair on the porch. This story is so unbelievable it almost can't be true, she muttered, shaking her head. Google Earth, I said with a grim smile. It was like having a view from above. It would be funny if it hadn't been happening to me. Brittany looked at me with genuine sorrow. Dawn, I'm really sorry, she said softly. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I hope someday you can let go of the anger. I don't know if that'll happen, I replied turning to leave, but thanks for saying that. That was the last time we spoke face to face for a long while. A year passed and my personal life stayed the same. I still dated occasionally but wasn't looking for anything serious. My focus was on my kids. Watching them grow became a true joy. Brian, now ten, was interested in the family business and loved helping with the plants, especially the Japanese rock gardens. Danielle, at twelve, seemed drawn to healthcare but still had time to decide. It was my concern for Danielle that led me to volunteer as a chaperone at the school sock hop that fall. Angela and her new husband might convince me to help. If you have kids that age, you know how tough it is to get parents involved in these events. There I was, watching kids bounce around the gym, feeling out of touch with the music, when Angela appeared beside me. Hi, she said, startling me. What? I replied. Why don't you go talk to her? She suggested, nodding toward a woman across the gym. Angela, what are you talking about? I asked, confused. 
That teacher over there, she pointed. The cute brunette in the cream and charcoal sweater. She's been looking at you all night. Go talk to her before the event ends. I glanced around and spotted the woman. Are you sure she was looking at me? I asked skeptical. Trust me, Don, a woman notices these things. Go for it. I shrugged. Why not? I thought. She was attractive and I hadn't had much luck with anyone else. After a moment's hesitation, I decided to approach her. As I walked over, I realized she was about my age. When she turned, her bright green eyes caught my attention. Hi, I said as I reached her. I'm Dawn Summers, Danielle and Brian's dad. She smiled warmly and extended her hand. Hi, Don. I'm Don Rogers, Greg's mom, and I teach sixth grade here. Nice to meet you, Don, I said, smiling back. Likewise, she replied. It's rare to see a single dad chaperoning. I guess, I shrugged. But my kids are worth it. Besides, it's not like I have other plans. She raised an eyebrow. How do you know I'm single? I asked, curious. Well, your ring finger's empty, she said with a grin. And the woman you were talking to is here with her husband. I'm good at people watching, and you seemed unattached. You're very observant, I said, impressed. Yes, I'm single. She grinned, and I realized I was still holding her hand. Oh, sorry, I mumbled, letting go awkwardly. Don't be, she said with a chuckle. If it bothered me, I would have told you. Her smile brightened her entire face, and I was completely captivated. Her eyes, whether it was their striking green color or something else, were mesmerizing. I couldn't look away, nor did I want to. We spent the next few minutes talking about our kids. I mentioned that Danielle was already considering a career in nursing and how Brian enjoyed helping me with work. Don shared stories about Greg's love for electronics and the small challenges that came with it. Before I knew it, Angela nudged me again. Time to get the kids packed up, Don, she said, smirking at my confusion. The DJ's already packing up. We started gathering the kids to leave. After ensuring each child was with the right parent, we cleaned up and left the gym. As we walked to the parking lot, Don surprised me by slipping her hand into mine. Call me sometime, she said, placing a folded piece of paper in my shirt pocket. I'd love to have dinner with you. With that, she and her son headed to their car, and she was gone. That night marked a new beginning for me. I didn't wait long to call Dawn. She was absolutely charming, and I couldn't stop thinking about her. Our first dinner date didn't lead to the bedroom, but it did include some sweet kisses. She seemed as smitten with me as I was with her, but she clearly wasn't ready to throw caution to the wind. We took things at her pace. Dawn was intriguing in many ways. Smart, practical, and resourceful. Like me, she didn't have much money to spare, so she came up with simple life hacks to save. She shared them with me, helping us free up funds for other things. In return, I learned that she was an avid gardener, though she often joked about her black thumb. Fortunately, I knew some techniques for reviving struggling plants and was happy to share them. I also helped her with a few budget-friendly projects around her house, turning her backyard and patio into an outdoor living space. Naturally, I told her about Brittany and later about Mandy. Saying she was shocked would be an understatement. Unlike other women I had shared this with, she wasn't particularly fazed by the fact that I had posted the video online. Actions have consequences, she said simply. All things considered, she got off lightly. Don got along well with my kids, and I must admit her son Greg was a good kid. The kids seemed to get along too, which was a relief. As time passed, our relationship deepened, both emotionally and physically. After eight months, I found myself considering marriage again. Thoughts of the disaster with Mandy lingered, but I wasn't going to let the past ruin my future. I talked to my kids about it. Danielle was thrilled. Brian wasn't as enthusiastic but agreed it would be okay. Privately, I suspected he was still hoping I'd reunite with Brittany. 
Finally, I bought another engagement ring. The one I had for Mandy had been sold. Now I just needed to decide how to propose to Don. After some thought and consulting with my mom, I decided to do it on my 40th birthday, which was just two weeks away. It wouldn't be a big party. Just my closest friends, my parents, and Don and Greg. I thought it would be perfect. The only challenge during the two weeks of waiting was keeping the kids from spilling the secret to Don and Greg, sending a secret invite to Don's parents and brother, and making sure I didn't accidentally give away my plan. Finally, my birthday evening arrived. My parents rented a party room at Misha's, a local restaurant known for Russian cuisine. The dinner was excellent, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. We had a great time eating and dancing. When it came time for gifts, I opened them and thanked everyone. Dawn seemed surprised to see her parents and brother at the party, but remained composed. After unwrapping the last present, I stood up, wrapping my arms around Dawn and gently pulling her close. She rested her head against me as I smiled at everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight, I said, beaming with happiness. You've made this the best 40th birthday ever. My joke got polite laughter and I heard one of the kids say they didn't get it. The laughter provided a perfect cover for Angela to discreetly hand me the ring box. There's just one last thing to do before we all leave, I said, my heart pounding. I've received great gifts tonight, but I'm hoping for one more. Don tilted her head, looking at me with a puzzled expression. Don, I love you so much, I said, meeting her gaze with a grin. You've completed my life. The only way it could get better is if you'd spend the rest of it with me. I got down on one knee and presented her with the open ring box. Don, will you marry me? The room went silent as everyone realized what was happening. I looked into Don's eyes, expecting her joyful yes. But she hesitated. I waited and waited some more. Don, I finally said my voice wavering, please say something. Uh, she mumbled turning away from me, her eyes darting around the room. Don, this, this isn't really the right time to talk, maybe we should. She stammered, backing away from me I sighed and stood up, feeling my heart break. Don rushed to Greg, took his hand and hurried out of the restaurant without even stopping for her coat. A few seconds after she left in a hurry, I turned around to see everyone staring at me in disbelief. Well, I said, forcing a wide, fake smile. Thanks for coming out and making this a great evening. Have a good night, everyone. I gathered my things, slipping the ring box into my coat pocket and motioned to the kids. Don, honey, my mom said softly, taking my hand. Do you want us to take the kids tonight? I shrugged, not really caring. Do you guys want to spend the night with Nana and Pappy? Yeah, that would be great, Brian said excitedly. Danielle looked at me with sad eyes. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Thanks, Danny, but you don't have to say anything, I said firmly, cutting her off. I wasn't ready to hear any sympathy yet. I just want you to know I love you, Daddy, she said quietly, hugging me tightly. Love you too, Danny, I whispered, trying to hold it together. After saying goodbye to my parents, I headed home. The drive was short, but it felt like forever. Once inside, I locked the door, tossed my things on the couch, and grabbed a beer. I drank it quickly, but it didn't last long enough to numb the pain. I thought about going to the liquor store, but decided against it. Getting drunk wouldn't solve anything. Instead, I sat in a chair and watched 80 sitcoms on Netflix. After a few hours, I got drowsy and eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up with a stiff back from sleeping in the chair. I won't do that again, I thought as I went through my morning routine and took a shower. While getting dressed, I remembered that I hadn't turned on my cell phone since the night before. I turned it on and saw my voicemail box was full. There were also several text messages, all from friends offering sympathy and an ear to talk. The voice messages were much the same, except for one from Dawn. It was short, only a few seconds long. I'm sorry, Dawn, her voice said. Please believe me, I have my reasons. I hope someday you'll understand and forgive me. Goodbye. 
I didn't respond to any of the texts or calls. I spent the rest of the day in a fog, trying not to think about dawn. That, in fact, is the story of my life. In many tales, the cheated husband ends up rich, marries a supermodel, and lives in a mansion. But that's not how my life turned out. It's been ten years since my divorce from Brittany. Danielle is in college, studying nursing. Brian just graduated from high school and will be starting college in the fall. He plans to become a businessman, though whether he'll join the family business remains to be seen. As for me, I'm 45 now and still single. Occasionally I meet someone for some fun, but I don't have anyone in my life I'd call special. A year ago, Mandy came back into my life, in a way. She just wanted to have a good time. And she made that clear from the start. We partied for a couple of months, then parted ways without any hard feelings. Why didn't you ever get married, she asked me one night. I shrugged. It's no longer worth the risk. I'd love to have a wife, but not all stories have happy endings. And it seems mine doesn't. Dawn's parents told me she moved in with someone about a year after my failed proposal. They came to me, hoping I could convince her to return. I thought it was absurd, considering being with me might have been why she left in the first place. I never sought out more information, and she never explained her reasons. Brittany eventually remarried, this time to the owner of the diner where she worked. The kids say they're happy and I hope for his sake he had her sign a prenup. My father passed away a few months ago, leaving the family business to me. Unfortunately, I don't think my mother will be around much longer. She's consumed by grief. The pain of losing my father is evident in every move she makes and every word she speaks. I've always wanted a marriage like my parents had. Loving and committed. But maybe that's not possible in today's world. I'm a landscaper, not a philosopher. So I'll leave those questions to the experts. Before leaving me for the second time, Mandy asked an interesting question. Do you have any regrets? Of course I do, I replied. I regret marrying a cheater. I regret wasting my time with Mandy and Dawn, thinking they were life partners. I regret not finding someone who shares my values and desires. But then I realized what she was really asking. She wanted to know if I regretted making Brittany a famous amateur star. She wondered if I regretted divorcing her and hating her for years. The honest answer is no. I regret that releasing the video was necessary, but I don't regret doing it and I never will. She got what she deserved. If I had to do it all over again, I'd do the same thing. As for me, I'll keep working. I'll continue to love my kids and watch them grow. I'll look forward to seeing my grandchildren when the time comes. I haven't completely given up on finding a wife, but it's no longer a priority. I'll find happiness where and when I can. It's not the life I would have chosen, but it's not a bad life.